welcome to Washington Talk. I'm Eun Jung Cho. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un visited China this week and vowed to work for welcome results in his second summit with President Trump. When negotiations get back on track, verification will be a key issue. Today, we take a look at how best to verify North Korea's denuclearization steps. We're negotiating a location. It will be announced probably not in the not too distant future. In the studio with me today, Mr. Oli Hainonen, Senior Advisor at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Mr. Hainonen is the former Deputy Director General of the International Atomic Energy Agency. Also joining me today, Mr. Frank Genuzzi, President of the Mansfield Foundation and former advisor to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Welcome to the program. Good morning. morning. Now, um, Chairman Kim Jong-un's visit to China signals that the U.S. and North Korea second summit may be imminent. And before the second summit, groundworks are needed. So other than the logistics, what other denuclearization discussions do you think are needed? Well, I think you need working level talks, which still haven't taken place. So I'm very concerned that if they rush ahead with a, a top level summit meeting, they're going to get a second a repeat of the Singapore uh, summit. Uh, a lot of nice words, uh, very little substance, and it may not generate the kind of momentum they need. So I'd like to see uh, at least a few concrete deliverable steps, especially on uh, the initial progress toward denuclearization, uh, matched by some corresponding measures on, on sanctions relief and peace. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Hainunen, when do we start talking about inspections? When does inspection regime come into the discussion negotiations? Well, actually, one has to th think it a little bit from the beginning, and in that sense that we have to define, first of all, what is denuclearization. And a part of that package is a very crucial question at uh, what kind of nuclear capabilities North Korea may have after the denuclearization. Are they going to have a civilian nuclear program or not? Certainly they have to dismantle all weapons programs. But this has a tremendous impact on the overall undertaking. And then we have to define the goal as well. One can say, okay, all the nuclear weapons are away. But the question is to which level of confidence you want to have it for the United States of America. International Atomic Energy Agency and others, they have different standards. So it's a very complex situation. And I think that it has to start with this definition. And, and then once you have defined what is your end state, then you, as you know, he said, then you look which are the steps to achieve that and what kind of additional incentives one may want to give to North Korea to get them to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. when do we talk about inspections and verifications? Yes, and then when you have this definition, then the first thing is actually agree, like we did in agreed framework and before, have a detailed technical discussions with the North Koreans how to do this. And that discussion can only start if you have a full, complete declaration in yes. front of you. Then you agree on the basic inspection principle. And then you have a declaration, you go to those sites, you see whether these numbers, building drawings, material amounts roughly match uh, what uh, North Korea has stated. And only then you can actually make things like a dismantlement plan or disablement plan. You cannot do it without uh, seeing and having a detailed information from sites. And then you agree on those. And then from there on, it's a pretty straightforward actual inspection work, which I, for example, or some others have done all over the world. So that is the easy part, the inspection. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the United States and North Korea will likely pick up from where they have left off. And North Korea has um, offered to bring in inspectors to the Punggye-ri nuclear test site. Mm. So how important is Punggye-ri for the United States? I want to emphasize something you said uh, just before. Um, the idea that before you get to the actual inspections, the inspection part is sort of the easy part, uh, but getting a, a detailed declaration, defining the terms of denuclearization, understanding what it is you're going to be monitoring and measuring, uh, that's really sort of the hard part. And, and that's why I worry a little bit, if we focus too much on Pyongyang-ri, you know, that's, that's where they tested nuclear devices. And, and it's important that, that we eventually get deeper clarity about what happened there. But I'm more concerned about where they're producing fissile material today, uh, where they're maybe uh, assembling weapons grade material today. And, and, and I think that rather than focus so much on the test site, um, we ought to be prioritizing uh, operations at Yongbyon. Mm -hmm. um, at Pyongyang-ri, uh, I'm not the expert, but I think that what we're most interested in probably is, is getting better clarity about the, the weapons that were tested there, as well as whether or not those tunnel complexes are truly disabled or not. And I think both of those are capable. Uh, we, we could get good answers to those questions if we had on-site uh, mm -hmm. visits. Mm -hmm. So drawing on from lessons from the agreed framework and the six-party talks, how important is it to have the declaration list early on? Well, it, it's, uh, first of all, it's a litmus test. You will see from there, is North Korea this time honest in its declarations? Because in the past we had these problems we, which then left, led to this situation where we are today. And if North Korea agrees to give, give a full, complete declaration on past and current nuclear program, and that appears to be correct, this is entirely new avenue which will be open in a cooperation. And why it is important to have this declaration and why it's a good test. Because North Korea doesn't know what the intelligence people know about their nuclear program. So if you omit some pieces, try to hide. Here you have a good test because they don't know what you know. Certainly we don't know everything, that's, that's obvious. So that's why I see that uh, declaration uh, as an important step. Uh, and then from there on, then you start the actual work. Mm -hmm. And Frank, how important is Yongbyon? Well, uh, to me, Yongbyon is, is the most important uh, piece of the North Korean nuclear puzzle, but it's by far uh, from being the only piece. Um, at Yongbyon, we know they have the plutonium uh, producing uh, reactor and radiochemical laboratory. We know they have centrifuges spinning highly enriched uranium. And we want to get clarity about those activities as also on the past operating uh, uh, history of the radiochemical laboratory and how much plutonium they produce. So, so Yongbyon is certainly the centerpiece uh, of their nuclear establishment. But there are other facilities that eventually are going to need to be declared and, and, and inspected. Uh, weapons manufacturing facilities, missile facilities are probably you know, part of what the international community cares about. So, so uh, the, the scope of this could be quite broad. Uh, I think there are dozens, if not hundreds, of, of potential sites inside North Korea that the international community wants to get eyes on. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree much of it. But you know, I would not emphasize actually too much about Nyombyon. It's important. We know to a certain degree how much they probably have produced plutonium. And the major problem there is actually just to do the actual verification and then do the, I think, uh, maybe full dismantlement would take a long time. But do some kind of better disablement which has been done in the past so that they cannot anymore in a reasonable way operate the plutonium. Uh, production facilities. Enrichment program, the way I see and the information which I have got uh, uh, mainly actually after I left the IAEA points to the direction that there, there are additional uh, enrichment plants and it's important to to look what they are, where they are and what is the size of them. Mm -hmm. And if you look the Neon Beyond design, it, it, the enrichment plant, it really tells you that there might be this other element, which actually is the one which is producing the high-enriched uranium. It's somewhere else. Dismantling or centrifuge plant is easy. You saw at the joint plan of action, Iran disabled certain functions in a few weeks' time. So it will not take 
long time. Then important for me are those which he mentioned, weapon manufacturing facilities, which we probably don't know too much. Once you disable those and get understanding how much material went there, you can trace it with the original material. You start to feel comfortable that if they start to restore the program, you will find it in time. But uh, and those facilities are very small. Some of them will fit to the studio. So it will be difficult to find as well. You know, Yun Chung, uh, there's an important point there that we shouldn't lose. There is always going to be a risk that North Korea may try to resume operations at facilities that we have either disabled or, or, or even dismantled. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the key to a successful inspection and monitoring regime is not so much that we can always uh, forbid that effectively from ever taking place, but if they do try it, we need to have clarity, early warning, yeah. and the ability to respond. Mm -hmm. yeah. What other factors are, in, are needed for the successful denuclearization of North Korea? Uh, first of all, we need a lot of money. This is not going to be cheap. Uh, and we still don't know what is waiting there. And particularly like uh, taking, if there is a big stock of already manufactured nuclear devices, it takes a little bit of effort to remove them safely once they agree to that. So that's the important thing. But the second most important thing is the North Korean cooperation. Mm. So that they let the, they give the information which is needed. They are proactive, mm. so they try to help the uh, investigators to find the solution. Uh, and then, you know, you, you need to have an access unimpeded anywhere, any place, like we had in South Africa, uh, in a co 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 cooperative way. And it doesn't mean that, you know, you, you just decide that I go here and there. There has to be a reason behind. And I think that the South African arrangements, from, from my perspective, were pretty good. And there's another lesson also when you look at South Africa. How did the IAEA approach it? Because it was like a crime scheme where there was not any more body because they had dismantled the nuclear weapons. Mm. So we had to verify uh, how many nuclear weapons and how much material they had passed, produced at that time when they had the weapons program. Mm. And at that time, the manufacturing facilities existed, but they had been dismantled. Mm -hmm. So we had to do those. So we divided this in three time windows. Mm. The first year was the big picture. We knew what was the design of uh, South African nuclear weapon. Then next following year, year number two, we narrowed it what is called in a safeguard parlance significant quantity, mm -hmm. which a normal uh, country needs to manufacture a nuclear weapon, a little bit more advanced weapon. So that was year number two. And I think that if I look, for example, United States of America government point of view, this is probably enough to get people relaxed when you see, achieve that. And then IAEA did this much more detailed material accountancy, which took 10 years mm. in case of South Africa. But uh, the reason was mainly that we didn't have a proper instrumentation mm -hmm. had to develop those first. Mm -hmm. so Here we, we are better off. Can we dismantle North Korea's nuclear uh, facilities in a much shorter time within President Trump's first term in office? <laughs> This goes back to this goal, which I said that what is your, your goal for uh, uh, dismantlement or disablement? If you ask me that, you know, can I set it in such a way in two years' time that I have a quite good assurances that not enough material for one nuclear weapon is missing, providing that, there, providing that the weapon is not overly sophisticated. If it is a very small, we may have a trouble. But during that two years time, you can practically eliminate uh, all their possibilities to produce any plutonium or high energy uranium in existing facilities for nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. And you probably have a good understanding that uh, there is no testing site and uh, no additional manufacturing site for the weapon itself. So mm -hmm. that is doable, mm -hmm. but with the cooperation, uh, what do we do about ICBMs? Well, we have to first, as uh, Dr. Heinen has uh, explained, we have to decide how important they are to us compared to other delivery systems and, and weapons. Uh, you know, 
rocket technology is sort of almost by its very uh, um, uh, essence, dual use. Uh, so uh, North Korea is going to possess uh, sophisticated rocket technology from now until the foreseeable future. And what we want to do is make sure that none of those rockets are mated to warheads with nuclear weapons aboard. So uh, I think we need to know where these facilities are. We need to have a, a complete inventory of, of which missiles exist. We need to have an understanding of, of what kind of warheads have been manufactured to go on them. Um, but I'm concerned by the ambition that the international community seems to have of sort of eliminating you know, all of North Korea's uh, rockets. I, I don't think that's an achievable uh, objective. And what I would like to do is to see the international community essentially work with the North Koreans to transform any uh, missile and rocket facilities from a military use toward a potential you know, civilian or peaceful uses. Um, and, and then to have the, the surety uh, that none of those uh, rockets are, are mated to uh, nuclear warheads. Mm -hmm. I agree with this uh, rocket thing. It's going to be a difficult thing. And, you know, if I were a North Korean, I would approach this very carefully because if you look, for example, the Japanese or South Korean missiles, they go today very far. So you don't want to cut your uh, short range or medium range missiles much shorter than Japan or South Korea has at this point of time until you have built a confidence and you have a cooperation in those countries. So this is going to be a sticky issue. And it's important that people don't only concentrate on ICBMs because I think that's the easy part of the problem. The difficult part are those medium and short range miss missiles. Why are they more difficult? Because, uh, you know, they read still, uh, you know, U.S. folks in uh, South Korea, there are hundreds of thousands of people, American citizens living in Asia. They re re reach the capitals in Japan and in South Korea. Uh, so, you know, if there is some nuclear capability still, and even with the conventional capability, so that is going to be tough tough thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, you probably have seen that recently South Korea started to develop uh, missiles with a longer range. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll leave it here and watch video for our next discussion. The leaders of China and North Korea projected a show of unity this week. Currently, North Korea's talks with the U.S. is at a standstill, while China is in a trade dispute with the United States. Now, considering the ongoing denuclearization talks, what did Chairman Kim want to gain from visiting China? Well, it's fascinating. This is, I guess, his fourth trip in, in a matter of uh, 12 or 15 months. Uh, I, I think he, prior to the previous summit meeting, he tried to sort of secure his flanks. He reached out to the South, he reached out to China to make sure that his position was secure before engaging with the United States. I think this is very similar in, in terms of his objectives. But he may also have been wanting actually to get a little bit of advice from Xi Jinping about how to manage his relationship with President Trump at this critical time. Uh, I think China wants success for the U.S.-North Korea engagement process. I, I disagree with some of those in the United States who seem to think that China's trying to throw up obstacles uh, to the peace process. Uh, I think China wants success, but I think China also wants to instruct Chairman Kim um, on, on who their, their real uh, strategic uh, friend may be, and it's not going to be the United States. So uh, it was, I think, a little bit of a, of a dual purpose visit, mm -hmm. partly to get some advice about how to handle Trump, partly to kiss the ring of Chairman uh, Xi Jinping and, and, and reaffirm that, that North Korea will listen to China's advice. Mm -hmm. And what constructive role can China play in denuclearizing North Korea? Uh, first of all, we have to remember that um, uh, North Korea is very isolated, has very little friends. So it's good for them to have this kind of connection which is, which is uh, in China. Uh, North Korea is also the uh, industry and 
universities and all, they need a lot of help in order to reconstruct the country and move it to more peaceful nature. So I think China is a good partner for that. And there are a lot of resources there. Then for the denuclearization, there are certain things which are a little bit difficult to do like this dismantling of the facilities. So I think that one can take an advantage of China on those, so you don't trans need to transport plutonium in uh, airplanes, you can put them a train, which is much safer, etc. So they have their expertise, and they have also technical expertise for dismantlement. Mm -hmm. I think at the very end, the Chinese probably want that there is a state called North Korea ne as their next neighbor and nobody else. Mm -hmm. And Frank, um, President Trump said President Xi promised him to work with him 100% on North Korea. So is currently China a help or a spoiler in U.S. efforts? I think the important thing to understand about China is that it will pursue its own national interests. And so while there's some alignment between China and the United States, uh, both want a denuclearized Korean peninsula, uh, there's also some important differences. Uh, uh, as uh, Dr. Heinen pointed out, I think at the end of the day, China wants a, a stable, peaceful, prosperous North Korea on its border rather than a unified American treaty ally uh, under democratic governance on their border. So, so the United States shouldn't go into this process naive about China's long-term intentions. Uh, uh, the United States would welcome, frankly, the dissolution of the North Korean state at some point in the future, whereas I think that China for now and for the foreseeable future would prefer uh, that North Korea continue to exist. So, so um, we have some alignment, but no, they're not going to work with us 100%. Mm -hmm. And you've been involved in the North Korean denuclearization issue for the past 30 years. And what did you notice most notable about China? Well, in the beginning, they always said to us that, you know, Let's be patient, let's negotiate, let's not do any radical uh, moves, let's not exercise pressures, particularly in 1990s when, when we started this process with the special inspection. And, and then, but then when uh, they realized that uh, North Korea had also developed this nuclear explosive capabilities, then they changed because, you know, it's a risk for them in two ways. Uh, one is that, you know, if there starts to be some nuclear, you know, threats, it, it has an impact on China. Yes. And then the other thing is, and let's be honest, you know, this uh, North Korean nuclear facilities are not the safest in the world. Uh, and the fact that they are operating there, if there's an accident of any kind, I think that it has an impact also on certain areas in in China and in South Korea and fishing uh, mm -hmm. uh, right. there. Mm -hmm. So that, that they have to take, take you into account as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's certainly China's one of concerns. Um, let's now move on to our next segment. Now time for the photo moment. Time to look at an interesting North Korea picture. Today we have a picture of the President Xi and Chairman Kim's meeting at Beijing's Great Hall of the People on Tiananmen Square. Chinese TV channels showed footages of Chairman Kim taking notes as President Xi was making a speech. Frank, what's your reaction? Well, there's a bit of a contrast with the meeting picture we saw with Pompeo, where Chairman Kim had no notes, uh, no briefing book, and, and just was sort of engaging in a conversation. And, and here you have a student, Kim Jong-un, listening to the Lao Shi, the professor, mm -hmm. Xi Jinping. Uh, I, I'm struck by a kind of a pupil-teacher relationship that mm -hmm. is uh, conveyed in this photograph. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a co more a kind of conversation, hopefully not a lecture, mm -hmm. because lectures don't always work. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it would be nice also to see the picture. Are there other people in the room? Mm -hmm. And because now this happens in China, I'm not so sure that the North Koreans are able to rec record everything which is, is done. But I would, I'm really interested who else is sitting in that room. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Mr. Januzzi, Mr. Heinonen, thank you. thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. And this was Washington Talk from the Voice of America, and I'm Eun Jung Cho. Join us next week for more analysis on North Korea.